if we go and look at our presentation to go with this, okay. you know, just give it some background, some scientific background and, and some numbers, because people don't realize how big this numbers game is actually. Okay. So in this regard here, organic matter changes. Okay. So just, we've got to notice the difference just between organic carbon increase. So 1% organic carbon is equivalent to 2% organic matter. That's something to get your head around to kick that, off with, actually. Uh, and and then look, just look over to the right-hand side of the screen. It says humus contains 50 to 60% carbon. See, so like this is the double the number. So you get organic right. carbon in the soil and you just double it up and you get the amount of humus in the soil. Okay. Okay. Now, when he talked about organic particulate sticking to the soil, I talk about humus. And it really has to be digested completely to actually stick to the soil and do its job. And just look at the numbers. I mean, there's 30 to 40% carbon, 3 to 4% hydrogen, 4 to 5% nitrogen. This is a biggie. It's a real biggie about this. This, this is where we start getting into, when you realize this, there's less need to put nitrogen on. Absolutely. Like when you start bouncing the numbers up and you start realizing, look at the phosphorus at 0.4 to 0.08 and going, this is, these are numbers are pretty big too. Sulfur, 0.4 to 0.06. These are big numbers when you start to actually calculate right through the soil. They're huge numbers. But this is basically all humus, when it's digested, fits within these ratios. And that's not just dead organic matter on the soil. It's broken down, digested, and it's holding onto the soil. It's got a job. So we move to the next screen. So you think about this. So in a soil test, we always test the top 150 mils. Okay. Yeah. So in a, in a hectare, that's 10,000 square meters, 100 meters by 100 meters, there's 1,500 cubic meters, or if it was a one ton, 1,500 tons of soil okay. in per hectare that we're dealing with. So if you increase the organic matter by 1%. Just 1%. Just 1%. There's 15 tons increase. Holy heck, that's amazing. 1% organic matter increase, you've lifted your soil weight by 15 tons. Yeah. Now, to go with that, look at that. When you calculate the numbers, you've just put 675 kilograms of nitrogen. That's about 1.3 tons of urea. Amazing. Yeah. And so it doesn't have to go much, and there's some massive changes happen. So 7.5 kilograms of phosphorus. Now, this is really important because, like, if you look at a dairy farmer who's doing a thousand kilograms of milk solid, they you take off the farm about 0. 0.6 or six kilograms per a thousand kilograms of milk solids per hectare. Yeah, we've already got it covered. Okay, but it must be that's that's, that's oh my god. I mean, it's it's expensive stuff if you're going to put that on, right? Yeah. So how difficult or expensive is it to get that just one percent increase? It's not hard at all. Okay. It's not hard at all, but you just need to know the limiting factors. And as we go through this video, and, and Louis Shipper is going through, and he's showing the different things that are happening, I go, I know what causes that issue. Mm -hmm. And we can actually talk about it and see, look at the amount of sulfur. And like, these are the things that we see when the soils become really healthy. The sulfur availability comes up. The nitrogen availability comes up. Phosphorus is hanging out there all ready to go. And we don't see it escaping into the water. Mm. We see it in a really healthy way. It's like, this is food for the plants, but it ain't going out in the water because it's bound into the humus part of the soil. It's brilliant. You know, nature's a brilliant beastie thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you look at it, yeah, just put it into the next context, just to give you a context of this. Do you want to see the next slide? Yeah, we'll one? have a look at the next slide. Sure. This. So now this is... The difference between a soil that has got 8% organic matter and how much nutrients available and 16% organic matter. We've had a, actually a bit of a jump here from 1% and 2% though. Yeah, that's, I'm saying every time that 1% goes, but like when we go and do soil samples, right? This yeah. is why I've put this here. We regularly, I mean regularly, get samples over on the left that are 8% organic matter. Okay, so, okay. That, so the eight percent sort of represents something that's kind of average. Yes, we see that a lot. It depends on the soil type and who's farming it, whatever. But we see that a lot. But to double, it's got to be no, no. This is where we're where this is where we're at. Really, this is where we're at. Wow. So if you look at it now, I've got ten tons of nitrogen per hectare, which is twenty tons of urea. I've got 
double the amount of phosphate available through the humus. Those numbers are huge. Yeah, the, the, the bounce. 10,800 uh, kilograms? Yes. Of nitrogen? Yes. Now, and you, you've seen this picture of the farm and we've done the water tests, which we're going to talk about in another video, but like my water test showed 0.07 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen leaving the farm. Right. So you've got it in a form that's really locked into the organic matter. It's in the soil. So what happens with organic matter when it oxidizes, when it gets heat hot over summer, it oxidizes off and releases the minerals. The carbon dioxide then becomes available for the plant because it's got to photosynthesize, it's got to take carbon dioxide in, and then the minerals become available in the soil. It's, nature's got to fuss ordered out way better than we do. Without spoiling what's coming up, but I've watched the video ahead of time, there's a moment where uh, Louis talks about we get to the height of summer and then it starts to drop, right? Now, I know what's coming, but you just spoke about the heat of summer making it come out. Yes. So that becomes a problem in his graph. He's got good information too, doesn't oh, he? Yeah, no, great information. But, I, but the, he highlights that. We'll see it. He highlights that as an issue. Yeah, and I see that what what we've missed, and we'll talk about this again, the things that we've missed in organic matter production and have not been talked about, but he shows you where they start going wrong. And I'll, I'll – We'll, we'll just keep going, Stephen, because otherwise we'll be here all day yeah. thinking about what's going on in the future. But look at the numbers. They're massive. Yeah. You cannot afford to put these sorts of numbers together all the time by paying for it out of a bag. No. And it won't hold. The more that you try and put the one on the right hand in place, the more it goes down the drain and the less you get on the left-hand side. So it's, it's a disaster. Waiting to get. You keep throwing it at it, it won't work. If you nurture it, it'll work for you. Okay, we'll head back to the YouTube app. Eh? Okay. About resilient pastures and how they may contribute to maintaining at best, uh, at worst, or improving the carbon stocks of soils, what do we need to be thinking about? And just as a quick aside, uh, the majority of New Zealand soils are at steady state under, under flat land for carbon contents. We're not quite sure what's going on in the hill country, but we're working on that. That's something we can come to. The, the reason that we have carbon in soil is because we have a small difference between the amount of photosynthesis that we have coming into the system and the amount that's going out in respiration. These are two very large processes that are going on every year. And as that carbon goes into the soil, it gets stabilized by microorganisms into this particular organic matter and the mineral associated organic matter. And we want to get it there so that we can hold it in this case for the services we were looking for. So these are my key messages that I'll come back to. And if we're thinking about resilient pastures, this is what we want to try and do. Maintain cover. Continuous inputs of carbon into soil, which may mean that we need pastures that require less renewal. We may need to think about optimizing the supplemental feeds that we use because they go through uh, renewal periods as well. And I'll show you a little bit of that in a bit. One of the key things, and we've heard this multiple times, what are the roles of roots? We need to maintain roots and root inputs into soil. And we need to make sure that we are uh, getting dung returns back to the paddocks. And we'll talk about that. Okay, now well. we'll just stop there for a second. So we, this is really interesting. You know, we're talking about um, photosynthesis or against respiration, right? Yeah. And we're we've all been we're caught in this visible world. We're caught by the plants that are growing, and and Lewis is going to talk about Lewis is going to talk about these other plants and their roots and all that. And yeah, I hear this all of the time. You know, like, uh, Christine Jones is the the liquid par carbon pathway, the stuff that comes down the plant and into the roots, and this is the process that it goes about. And I'm going to challenge all of that because what we've seen is that people have neglected the single basis of the whole of humanity, which is a cyanobacteria, which is actually the part that does the job. Mm. And it's, I think it's something like 85 or 90% more efficient at photosynthesis than any other plant on the planet. Yeah. Now, what and it's a bacteria. Well, it's a plant, but it's a, it, it, it's an interesting thing. It's a photosynthesizing bacteria. Okay. It's And it's got all the organs and every part of it, just the same as all the cells that are made up in our bodies. Mm. And we're going to do a video or, or two or three on these little critters 
as we go forward because they're seriously important. They have DNA and they have all the cell structure. They have every function about waste and and we'll be able to watch how people, little grubs come along and gobble them up just like yeah. cows eat grass and all that sort of stuff. And so, But we can't see it. Yeah, yeah. We can't see it so it doesn't exist. But it, you look into cyanobacteria and you see that the world changed when cyanobacteria became part of the environment because it went from a – anaerobic situation to an aerobic all of a sudden. So then things can function, can respire with this. And what happens with that is that if it's going through photosynthesis, it takes in CO2 and it kicks out oxygen. So where did the carbon go? Yeah. And, oh, it goes in the soil. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, do We see it by our observable nature in the wintertime when they go nuts because they love living in a moist situation. Mm. They don't mind, they like it warm too, but most of the time you can't hold enough moisture in the soil for long periods of time over the summer for them to produce. So it's the winter time that they actually do all the, do all the, do all the work. But, you know, this is where I'm going to challenge what we're going to hear from Louis Shepard next. But this is cool material about how he's saying how the carbon stocks hold in the soil and what they do and respiration and all that. But I would like to turn that graph upside down. Ah.